Today we're going to focus on water, and I'm going to leave my comments. Uh, Adam is going to take us through this idea of water today and water throughout the Bible, the power of water and, and what it can mean to us. So everything that we're doing today, uh, our scriptures, our songs, our prayers, all leading up to the Lord's Supper uh, toward the end of our service, all deal with water. So today our service will be heavier on scripture reading. So I would encourage you to follow along with the passages and be mindful of this idea and the power that water has. This is uh, obviously an eye of a hurricane. And one of the things that uh, comes to mind for me with water is certainly storms and the chaotic nature that water has. And that's where we want to start our story today is the chaos of water. Think of creation in the beginning and think of something as powerful as a storm and the chaos that that can create in the eye of a storm. Water. It's everywhere. It covers almost three-fourths of the Earth's surface. We are made up of about 60% or more of water. Without it, we die. And yet, we were not designed to exist in a water environment. Now, sure, you can go swimming in water. You can go underneath the water. But only as long as you have breath. When we think about that, think about what God has done for us. We need water and what we are going to talk about this morning is this idea of God's rescue through water. Now, in this first section, I want you to think about chaotic waters. Just like Jeff said, put yourself in the midst of the hurricane, not in the eye, but in, in the hurricane itself and all of the, the raging that goes with it, the chaotic waters. What I want you to pay attention to is how God is separating the chaotic waters to make a place for us to live and thrive. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed each according to its kind, on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, 
it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the foundations of the great deep, verse 4, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind, everything on the dry land. In those nostrils was the breath of life died. Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 31. When Pharaoh grew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? It is not for what we said to you in Egypt, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And the Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you will only be silent. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forth. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten glory over Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who was going before the hosts of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was a cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground. The people, excuse me, and the waters became a wall to them on the right hand and on the left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen. And in the morning watched the Lord in the pillar of the fire and of the cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces in a panic clogging their chariot wheels so they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. 
And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to the normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea and the waters became a wall to them on their right hand and on the left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians and the Israel and Israel saw the Egyptians die on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians so that the people feared the Lord and they believed the Lord and in his servant Moses. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for everything that you have done for us. We know that you are the one and true God, the creator of the universe. We thank you, Father, for so many things that you have given us. But more specifically, we thank you for allowing your son to come here to earth and to die a painful, terrible death on our behalf. We thank you, Father, for your great plan of reconciliation. We ask, Father, special blessings for so many marriages that we have in our church today that need your help. We ask that steps be taken, that corrections be made. We ask, Father, that you'll be with the ill in our congregation. We ask for immediate healing. We ask, Father, that you'll bless all of our young people here and the ones that are just recently headed to the universities. We know that they face special challenges. We also ask, Father, that you bless our eldership here, that you give them wisdom that you give them the courage to make the right decisions, even when they are difficult ones. We ask, Father, that this worship service this morning is pleasing to you, and we hope that everyone that is here today is blessed by it. These things we ask in Christ's name, amen. God's story of creation begins, you might say, with chaos. We're told that creation begins with the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, and that the waters are formless and void, or the wording could be said, waste and wild. And then God, with his word, begins to order the chaos. He begins separating as he creates. Day one, he separates light from darkness. Day two, he begins to separate the waters, the waters above from the waters below. And day three... He separates the waters so that land emerges. God is creating this safe, dry place for humans. God is ordering the chaos, we might say, such that he is providing a place for creation so that humanity can flourish. But as we go through the story, we find that Humans made the choice to pursue evil and violence. And what that did is that brought the chaos back into the realm of creation. 
Man is so evil and violent that God is going to wipe them out with water. And so we have the flood. And really what we can say is the flood is a decreation event. It's reversing what happened in creation. Because we're told that God in Genesis 7, 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened. Think about that word, burst, or split. The idea is God was holding the, the chaotic waters back, and now he's opening it back up. The, the expanse from the heavens is pouring down. The, the waters from underneath are coming up, and they're covering all of creation. What God created on day five and day six is now destroyed by the waters. But God preserves a remnant, Noah and his family. Noah is on the ark and he has passed through the waters. And we're told in Genesis 8 and verse 1 that God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him on the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. I want you to see what's going on here. That word, God made a wind, it's the same Hebrew word as what we find in Genesis chapter 1, that the Spirit was hovering over the waters. It's the word ruach. Same word. And what happens this time? The waters are put back under control. Such that land begins to emerge again. So separating the waters becomes a way of rescue for Noah and his family. God cleansed the world of evil and violence and chaos so that now Noah and his family can walk out into a new creation. A space for humans to be what God intended them to be. But as the story goes on, man continues to do evil and violence. Which brings about more chaos. And so God must repeat this rescue through water. As was read for us, we then come to Israel. And they have been in slavery for so many years, and God remembered them, and he brings them out of Egypt. They are no longer slaves. And they come to the Red Sea. But Pharaoh is behind them, pursuing them. And they're fearful. What do we do? And Moses says, do not fear. Stand and see the salvation, or the word could be said, rescue of Yahweh. So God does just that. Exodus chapter 14, verse 21, Moses was told to stretch out his hand over the sea. And Yahweh drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided or separated. That word again, strong east wind, same Hebrew word, ruach. Dry land appears. We're to be drawn back to creation. We're to be drawn back to the flood and what God was doing. The waters were split or separated so that dry land appears. And the people cross on dry land, saved from the chaos. 
just like Noah and his family, the remnant is saved through the waters. And then what we also see is the picture of the flood in all of the Egyptians that chase after them. They're like humanity in the day of the flood because the walls of water come back over them. And God preserved Israel as that remnant. God tamed the chaos so that human life could flourish as they proceed to the promised land. But now let's look at water as a source of life. Consider what happens when there is no water. We die. Think about the, in God's story, the idea of wells, of springs, of pools. All of those are the, give the idea of life. Think about the wells that Abraham and Jacob dug. Or the fighting that went on, as we see in the story, over wells. Because people wanted that idea of life. They needed that life. Or Hagar, as she is in the desert, as after she and Ishmael have been exiled from Abraham's household. She's given just a little bit of water, and when that water dries up, she knows that Ishmael is about to die. She as a mother can't even watch her son die. So she sets him off in a place and she goes over to, the other, in, over to another area, but God shows her a well that gives life and sustains them. So in this next section, let's think about the water of life. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and name himself by the name of Israel. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, I have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Water and the image of water doesn't provide just physical life but it can provide emotional and spiritual life. Consider the times in the Bible where we see marriages beginning 
at a well. That idea of emotional life. It goes back to the very picture that we have in Eden of a man and a woman joined together by a source of water. God uses the imagery of water to show us spiritual life. He shows us the satisfaction that can be found in Him. Psalm 1 talks about the one who meditates on the law of God day and night. He's one who is like a tree beside the stream of water. In Ezekiel chapter 47, Ezekiel sees this vision of a new temple. And coming out of it is this stream of water. But it continues to build and build. And as Ezekiel's vision goes on, it is this river that is flowing out of the temple and it goes down into the desert areas. And it brings life. It is a river of life. And it is said in Ezekiel 47 and verse 12, And on the banks, on both sides of the river, There will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail. But they will bear fresh fruit every month, because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for healing. God uses all of these images of water and He's pointing us towards something. He's pointing us towards someone. And that is Jesus. As Jesus talks to the woman there at the well, they go back and forth talking about water and Jesus tells to her, I want to give you living water. Water such that you will never have to thirst again. Water such that you will be satisfied. The woman says, give me that water. God's own life is that which comes through Jesus to us to satisfy our deepest thirsts. And then later, in John 7, Jesus is at the feast and He cries out, if there is anyone who is thirsty, come to Me and drink. And you will find within you flowing rivers of living water. And John gives us a preview of what Jesus is talking about. He says, He's actually talking about the Spirit, the Ruach that is going to bring about new creation. So how do we get this living water? Well, now we want to turn to the culmination of God's rescue through water, and that is baptism. First, Jesus shows us the way as He Himself is baptized. And then we follow Him into our rescue, into the living waters. Let's think about that in this next section. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, 
he cannot enter the kingdom of God. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. When God's presence waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water, baptism which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. I hope as we were reading these passages Things start going off in your mind and you start making these connections now. Because when you think about Jesus and his baptism, that is the connecting point for all of these water images. Think about what we have in this scene. We're told that the heavens split and a dove descends. The Spirit. That should bring us back to creation. The Spirit hovering over the waters. It should bring us back to the flood and the wind that controlled the waters. It should bring us back to Exodus and the wind that separated the waters. We're told then that God spoke. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's what we have at creation. God speaking over the chaotic waters. And Jesus is there in the Jordan. We didn't talk about this one, but the Jordan River the very river that God stopped or dammed up or separated so that Israel could walk across on dry land. Jesus is in this river. All of these images should be firing in our minds as we think about this idea of baptism, that Jesus is being baptized to go through the waters on behalf of Israel and the remnant to die to bring redemption. Jesus is the culmination of God's story. His death is what separated chaos and sin. By his resurrection, he brings about new creation, a new way of living in a relationship with God. So what then does this mean for our baptism? It's not something that God just says, I want you to go do this. It's not just something that we do because, oh, well, this is what we do to become Christians. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying that your baptism is your rescue through water. That it is our way of becoming part of the story of God. That we connect to the flood. We connect to the exodus. We connect to creation itself. Because just like Israel and Noah were rescued through the waters, Paul brings that out to us, that we are like them as they were brought into a new creation, into the promised land. So we pass through the waters of baptism and become a new creation. 
Those waters, in those waters, we are identified with Jesus' death. And in that death, he separated the chaos of sin from our lives and our helplessness to do anything about that. We are no longer slaves to sin, just like Israel was no longer slaves. But trust in God that he will bring us through to the other side so that we can be that new creation, a new kind of human that can fulfill God's purpose. Paul says it this way in Titus chapter 3 and verse 4, but when the kindness of our God and Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, he rescued us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing, there's water, of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. There's the Spirit again. Whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life the river of life, the fountain flowing up within you to eternal life. There it is. That's what we have because God rescued us through the water. The Spirit recreates us spiritually to become that which God desires and fills us up with God's own life. How is all of that possible? It's because of the love that God has poured out for us. And as we turn our minds to the Lord's Supper, I want to bring two images to your mind. The first is of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Again, we have water. But here it shows us what God is willing to give up for us. It's one thing for deity to come into our world and put on our form, our flesh. But it's something completely different for that deity to get down and serve us. But that's exactly what Jesus did. And then we see Jesus on the cross. As he gave his life for us, we're told that after he died, they pierced his side and blood and water poured out. Blood that is our payment for sin. He shed His blood. He died for you and me. And the water is the image of Jesus' death as the fountain of life for us. That from Jesus, God's love that is willing to die for His enemies now flows down and out into the world to open a way, to open a rescue to new life. This is the love that was poured out for us. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, 
The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to portray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. I'd be thinking about one of the last things that Jesus did with his apostles washing their feet. And as we've been going through the story this morning of water, from chaos to the power of water to something as simple as a little bit of water to wash the apostles' feet. Be, th be thinking about that as we sing this song, and uh, Carrie's going to read uh, the event of Jesus on the cross and the blood and the water coming forth. And then Andy is going to help lead us in our prayers before we partake of the Lord's Supper again. I wanted to mention those things so you could prepare your minds as we come to the table together. Faithful love. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us, for this time to come together, and we thank you for the many blessings that you've given us in this life. We want to ask for your help, Father, in clearing our minds of all of the thoughts of our daily lives as we think about Christ and the sacrifice that was made on the cross for our sins. We thank you, Father, for the many examples we have throughout the Bible of your unfailing love and the salvation that you provide for those that follow you. We thank you for the life of Christ and the example that was a perfect example that was set for us. We thank you for this memorial that we have to remember Christ and the sacrifice through his death through which we have the hope of a home in heaven after this life. We pray now, Father, as we partake of this bread that represents his body, that we will focus on these things. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Father, we continue our thanks, giving thanks for this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood that was shed for us on the cross. We pray that as we partake of it, we will think back to the commitment that we made to follow you, the covenant that we have with you to live our lives and have you at the center of our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
you'll go back to the picture for just a second. So this is a scene uh, that's been reenacted of Jesus calling Peter out on the water. So this is Peter getting out of the boat. and In the foreground here is, is Jesus calling to him. It's such a powerful scene. The song we're about to sing, Oceans, is uh, inspired by this scene. And uh, sometimes in life we feel like we're drowning. Um, it could be something small, it could be something big, but uh, Jesus is there to call us out. And what a powerful thing, what a blessing we have in water. Uh, and I hope you've uh, benefited in this time we've had this morning to think about water and its power. Be thinking about Jesus there and us as Peter being called out on the water. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Holy Father, we come to you this morning grateful that we can come together and worship you. You are a great God, and you deserve all our love and all our praise and all our glory, Father. We would give you our thanks that we could be here this morning. Father, we know that throughout time, we can, we can look in the beginning, Father, when we lost that relationship with you, that, that Adam lost Adam and Eve lost that relationship with you that you have been seeking us out ever since. We pray, Father, that you would help us to draw closer to you. We know, Father, that, that uh, you're concerned about us when we don't seek your counsel. And, Father, we know that when we lay it out before you, as Hezekiah did, when his concerns and his cares and the troubles that they had with other kings and the dangers set before them that he went to you. Father, we know that if we are, have our cares and concerns, that if we seek you out, you will listen. We love you and praise you for that. Help us, Father. Help us in our hearts to draw closer to you, to be your children, to speak to you, to listen to you, and do your will. Help us, Father, because we want to be, have that face-to-face. -face. We want to have that time when this life is over that we can be in your arms. Father, we pray that you will be with Sandra. Keep her safe. Help us to encourage her. We ask, Father, that you be with Cindy's um, a daughter there and their family to keep them safe and provide their needs. Father, there are, we all have our issues, and we pray that we take them before you. We know that you listen, and we ask that you be with those that, uh, those that are sick, that are having illnesses and troubles and cares and concerns right now, and that we, that we will lay them out before you. Thank you, Father, for the time that we spent here this morning, and thank you, Father, for the, uh, the worship that we've had and pray that will affect our hearts and make us stronger throughout the week. Go with us, Father. Keep us and take us home with you in the end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.